I always feel like laying out your objectives first and giving the team a target to go after creatively and then evolve from there is super important. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. Today, I'm talking to automobile designer Derek Jenkins. Derek is the SVP of design and brand at Lucid Motors, one of the most exciting car companies in the electric vehicle space. Have you seen the Lucid Air? It's a luxury sedan that was named Motor Trend's 2022 Car of the Year, and it's definitely worth checking out. Prior to Lucid Motors, Derek was Director of Design at Mazda North America, and spent almost a decade as the Chief Designer at Volkswagen North America. He got his formal education with a Bachelor's in Transportation Design from Art Center College of Design. But before he even knew it was a career option, Derek grew up steeped in the car culture of Southern California. As a surfer and skateboarder, he embodied the physics of locomotion from a very young age. And by his teenage years, he was hands-on with the mechanics and engineering, restoring and modifying cars after school. As you'll hear, automobiles are sun-baked into his DNA, and everything about him is electrifying. Here's Derek. My name is Derek Jenkins. I'm the Senior Vice President of Design and Brand at Lucid Motors. Uh, I live in Malibu, California, but I work in Newark, California, where the Lucid headquarters is. How does that commute work? Lots of flying, a lot of back and forth. I spend my weekdays up here in Newark at the headquarters, and I spend my weekends in in lovely Malibu with my wife and two boys. So I am very excited to hear all about how you got to where you are now. So let's go back to the beginning and, and start from zero. You grew up in Huntington Beach, right? Surfing and car culture is baked into your... Your very being. Very much. In some ways, I think I was uh, really fortunate. A small surf town, it's grown a bit since I I uh, grew up there. But, you know, it is very much a kind of surfing and beach culture, Pacific Coast Highway and VW microbuses. And it had a lot of that. So I was I was exposed to a lot as a as a kid. Also, my father was really quite into cars, specifically more German cars that definitely rubbed off on me at an early age. And so as a result, I was mechanically inclined early on. So that, you know, manifested in playing with Legos and building go-karts and restoring vintage bicycles and and building mini bikes and shaping my own surfboards and car stereos. That was the beginning of the big car stereo craze. As I got a bit older, then naturally cars became more the focus you know, I restored my first car when I was 15. And that was kind of the beginning of it all, I would say. So backing up a little bit, um, you said your dad was into cars. Were you multi-generational in Huntington Beach or? No. So where did your parents grow up? My mom was from uh, Toronto, Canada. She moved down to Los Angeles when I think she was 19. And uh, my father was born in Ohio, but Uh, This is a strange twist. My grandfather took the whole family down to Panama to work on the canals. My dad went from three years old to about 18, uh, grew up in in the canal zone in Panama, and then moved to Los Angeles uh, to become a police officer, and that's where he met my mom. So this idea of mobility is something that's sort of been running through your veins for a while. Yeah, no question. Both both my parents were into cars. You know, my mom, she moved from Toronto to Los Angeles. She drove down in winter in an Austin Healey bug-eyed Sprite at 19 years old. You know, I mean, that's that's a bold move, you know, <laughs> <laughs> to drive through the Midwest in, in a car like that. And I think it was December, you know, it's that's bonkers, unthinkable today, you know. <laughs> so it sounds like you grew up with a lot of material agency. I mean, because you were tinkering, you were playing with a lot of things, you were getting your hands on things as diverse as, you know, wood and metal, but also fiberglass. And that fueled your passion were you feeling creative within that? You know, at the time, when I look back, I don't think I was thinking about it from a creative standpoint. You know, it's like that was the 70s and 80s. So we didn't have high profile examples of young artists or, 
or creative types. It was the traditional creative fields of painting and sculpting and things like that. So I, I felt like even though it's building stuff and making, in a sense, creative decisions on all these little projects and things I was building, I don't think I, I saw it that way. I did like to draw, but I wasn't. I was definitely not an artist in that traditional sense. It really was manifesting itself in the physical objects that, that I was working on and going towards probably the most creative thing of all that was my Lego phase, you know, <laughs> which I think yeah. is, I had really credit for kind of just expanding imagination. It was just such a wonderful toy pre-digital world that led to not only creativity, but the me mechanical in inclination and, and envisioning an object and then constructing it and building it. And then later on, that transition to the actual mechanical things like, like motorcycles and mini bikes and bicycles and, and ultimately cars. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You restored your first car at like 14 or 15? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that gets back into the Orange County thing because, you know, Orange County at the time, I would venture to argue, was the import car capital of America. I grew up with the first wave of kind of cool Volkswagen water-cooled cars, you know, GTIs and Scirocco's, and the first wave of cool import chip Japanese cars, you know, Honda Civics and Toyota Celicas and things like that. So I was immersed in, in that world, and I didn't care about American cars at all. I only cared about <laughs> European and Japanese cars, and, and it was like that. I feel like I was always that first generation of, of youth that, grew up not at all interested in American cars because the 70s was a pretty dark era and the 80s was definitely a dark era for American cars and quite the contrary for Japanese and, and German cars. I grew up in Detroit, so yeah, at the same time. Yeah, I was right there for the dark ages of American cars. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, then the affinity towards Porsches and Volkswagens and BMWs and Audis and Mazdas, uh, that all started then. And there was a big cruise culture. Obviously, Southern California is known for the weather, and, and that's a year-round car thing. It's in everything. And then you combine that with beach culture, because Orange County is the epicenter of modern skate and surf culture. Those two things go together, like, perfectly. And that's just the foundation of all, all those things I was passionate about. In many ways, still I am. I can see how that has shaped you. Your first car I read was a VW thing. Yes, yep. <laughs> Type 181, very unusual vehicle with unusual origins. Just a, it's just a strange, strange car. My father was all into these kind of like a Baja bug, you know, when they, they like a beetle that they cut up and uh, let the motor hang out. So we, we grew up going down to Mexico and camping and we'd go down there for holiday weekends and things like that. We had a 70s Chevy 10 van with bean bags and shag carpet. Never mind seat belts. I, I sat in, you know, I would take three hour trips sitting in a bean bag. So there you go. That was the 70s. And we'd tow the Baja bug down and we'd tear around San Felipe for the weekend and, and drive home. So I grew up doing that kind of stuff. And then when I had a chance to buy my first car, with my parents' blessing, the thing just seemed like this cool vehicle, <laughs> total surf safari car. And I found a car down in Newport Beach in this guy's backyard filled with leaves. The, the floors were rusted out and I got it dirt cheap and just started working on it. Didn't really know what I was really doing, but you know, my dad helped me a bit and it turned out great. I mean, I love this story. I'm thinking of you as a teenager, and that's this time when we're all going through a lot of change and awkwardness and angstiness. What were you like as a teenager, and was there some way in which this outlet was helping you process yourself and process who you were becoming? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of kids that age, sports was a big deal. So I was kind of balancing my sports life between surfing and soccer. That definitely kind of helps to be, you know give you confidence and group dynamics and things like that. The car thing was very much a uh, solitary thing. What was cool about kind of, as I got into the car thing, got my VW thing, I restored that. That was like, 
the coolest car in at school. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, I'm sure. And of I'm course, sure you stood out. Yeah, <laughs> everybody <laughs> wanted to ride in it. The girls all wanted to be in it. That whole idea of kind of like freedom and, and lifestyle, the car kind of represented that. And, and of course, the surfing piece of that, like I said, fits in it. So we'd get, we'd get f- four guys in the car and drive down to San Diego for the weekend and to go surfing in it. And in a way, kind of cliche of like teenage freedom. In my mind, a surfer movie is playing out, you know, the surfer teenage movie. (laughs) Right, right. As I mentioned before, like, that was the beginning of the big car stereo thing. This was kind of before car companies got serious about stereos in a production vehicle. So the aftermarket scene, uh, again, was the epicenter of that scene was definitely L.A. and Orange County. There was, like, competitions who, who could have the best car stereo. It really has its roots in Southern California. And so I got into that. So I, I was working jobs just to buy amplifiers and subwoofers. And, and so I got all into that scene. And so then music culture tied into it all. You know, so it's all now all of those things. It's lifestyle. It's beach. It's surfing. It's cars. It's music. It's all one big kind of thing. Yeah, you know, I grew up outside of Detroit, and my first car was a a 78 Microbus, which in that area was a very, like, odd sight on the road. And also, it had no heat, or it was like the heat came from the back. And so I used to drive around in the winter with a comforter, like, wrapped around me. Oh, I love that. And that's a bay window. I love that version. In fact... My close friend, because we, I was in the, on the surf team in high school, every morning we'd meet at Huntington Beach Pier, and we'd always take his van because he didn't care if we would wear our wetsuits. He'd let the water get all over the car. It was all rusted, and it was just this funny thing that we'd all pile in. And that, that car got so destroyed from three years of just salt water. And, and, but I have these incredible memories. It was orange and white. Yeah, super cool. This is clearly part of who you are. It's baked into your identity at this point. What were you thinking about making decisions about going to college or not going to college or what your livelihood would be as an adult? And how how were you sort of navigating that? I look back then and it's kind of a miracle that I I ended down this path of design in in a really creative focused field because that was really an unknown entity. Nobody was talking about car design at career day. For that matter, any kind of creative field in the business world was a very unusual topic. It was usually like you're going to go into economics and you're going to go into policing or you're going to go into you're going to be a firefighter or you're going to go study law. The big one back then was marketing, marketing. I'm going to go into study marketing. Again, there's the tie back to the surfing. I thought I wanted to perhaps be a mechanical engineer so I could be in and around cars and, and, and that. And I also realized what that would require from me from an education standpoint. And I wasn't particularly strong in, in math. Man, is that really what I want to do? My coach for my surf team, he was a, a really interesting guy. He, he was also the teacher of our ceramics class. And he's like, hey, listen, I know you love cars. You're always working on your car. You should go see the school in Pasadena. It's called Art Center College of Design. And they actually teach people how to design cars. And I'm like, bless bless him. Yeah. (laughs) And and he's like telling me about it. And I'm like, that just sounds so cool. And he's like, yeah, you really got to check it out. You know, and he just offered that to me because he knew I was always doing stuff with my car and I was customizing stuff. And and I was working on everybody else's car at that point. And he just offered that information out of the blue. And when he did, did your eyes light up like you can you can study car design in school and you can make that your job? That was exactly my reaction. I'm like, really? That's a thing? Again, there's no Internet. There's no YouTube. There's no tutorials on how to become a car designer. It it just didn't exist. Right. So I started researching it. And then my mom, one weekend, we did a tour up at the school and I saw what the students were doing and the, the sketching of cars and the clay models. Literally that day, it was like, this is what I'm doing. I think I just turned six. I was just driving. I'm super fortunate because it wasn't like I had to go through college and get a degree before I kind of figured out what I wanted to do, which is unfortunate because for a lot of folks, because they go to college, they're still trying to figure it out. 
and they can't use that formative time to drive towards the end goal necessarily, uh, so directly at least. I was from 16 on, you know, and then I started to take the drawing classes, and then I started to learn more about all those techniques, and I started to do more and more research of who were the top designers and where who designed this car and who designed this car, and so I was really really focused on it and then I started to take night classes up at Art Center pre-degree classes and so I gained a lot of momentum and I was able to submit a portfolio and get accepted it, by when I was 18 which was I was like the youngest person in my class at the time you know most of the people they were coming to Art Center as uh, for graduate degrees so I got like a big head start you know I really got in young got out young and started working right away and were the college years, did you get what you needed? Were they as nutritious as you hoped they would be in terms of teaching you everything you needed to know about what goes into designing a car? Because it's a multifaceted discipline. I feel like Art Center does provide you the general fields of skills. They teach you drawing. They teach you some fundamentals of vehicle engineering, aerodynamics, vehicle packaging, um, they, they give you a good art history, color theory, and of course just illustrating because the illustrate, especially at that point in time, it being able to illustrate sketch, you know, they're teaching you how to communicate your ideas as a, as a creative person effectively. And that was when they first started to teach you about like, this is how it works in a corporation. If you think about the, the monolithic nature of car companies historically and, and what that means from a business discipline standpoint, and then you throw in something as creative, creative and as whimsical as car design. Those two things, to get that all to work, is not easy. They teach you a little bit about that, but predominantly what I credit the school with is it's a forum where you meet some incredibly talented people. You know, it is, is attracting talented people, and the talent, the, the talent pool is like feeding off each other in a competitive way and making each other better. So the people that I, I went to school with were just so inspiring and drove you to another level. That was a big thing. And then the other thing it did is the school was so well connected with the industry that you know, you're getting all the top design leadership visiting the school uh, from, these, from all, all over the world, sponsoring projects, meeting students, and, and then offering internships and scholarships. I did an internship at, at Porsche in Germany. It just like catapulted my experience and knowledge because then now you're like, okay, now I'm in the place where it really happens. I'm not just going through the motions. So the fact that they put a lot of energy into those pathways, that those industry pathways is really huge. Huge, huge. which is, yeah. I'm sure it's not unlike other big, you know, really well-known school. I mean, that's what happens at Harvard. That's what happens at Stanford. It's the connections with the industries that are on the forefront of those disciplines and that the students are at real time contributing and, and then at the same time learning from, from the, the real world. So you mentioned an internship at Porsche. Did you go to Audi right after graduation? Or I did, yeah. Can you talk about the early chapters of your career and what that foundational experience was like and how it helped you sort of shape not only your practice but your philosophies sure sure yeah so i did the porsche internship and i followed that up with an internship at volkswagen at the advanced studio in, in los angeles that was a combined studio of volkswagen and audi so i met the leadership of the both brands at that facility and made some great contacts with jay mays um, at the time he was leading the audi studio I went back to school and then he hired me straight out of college, did a couple of projects in California, and then he got promoted to take over all of Audi design in Ingolstadt in, in Germany at the Audi headquarters. So then I've moved over to Germany at that point. How old were you? What an adventure. I know, Man. it was crazy. <laughs> I was 23. You know, I've been back and forth to, to Europe a few times, but I knew that if I wanted to really pursue the German car thing, I had to go go live over there. and. That was an interesting time because, you know, on one hand, they had an American leading the design team in, in Jay Mays, uh, but Audi was at a real low point in the industry. You know, that was a recession period in Germany, 1993-94. Germany reunification was just getting started. There was a, a really difficult economic time, 
and so I came into Audi. They were at a real low point. You know, I started there, and in the first two weeks, they cut my salary by twenty five percent. You oh know, my so God. I was like poorer than I was as a student, you know. But what was interesting is that they were so hungry to elevate the company to kind of BMW Mercedes status, which Audi was not anywhere near that at the time. There was a big push to reinvigorate the company and create new products. So my timing couldn't have been better because I was coming into this time where there was really great leadership at the top uh, all the way through the company and they were hungry for change and they wanted young talent to help them get there. And I came in there again with talented people from all over the world and I was able to just kind of like in a period of like two years soak up so many skills and so much um, experience working on my first projects and got to see the transformation of the brand real time because yeah, we that's were, incredible. Yeah, Audi was literally just barely skipping off the bottom <laughs> when I joined. They had a couple new models coming to market that elevated things, but what came next, and the, I'm happy to say the th- some things that I was directly involved with, but also just everything, the momentum they had over the next five years, we just saw massive improvement and being part of that rebirth or re kind of creation and establishing of that company taught me so much about that and what design could do and what, how a brand could transform in those early stages. Wow, that is fortunate to be able to witness that from inside the beast too. Uh, the transformation as it's taking hold, it's happening in all of the micro corners of the brand and you're hopefully it sounds like you were privy to those conversations and all and then part of something that grows and you feel like that collective camaraderie of growing something together too that's really powerful i'm so excited you had that experience and that totally feels a little bit like a rocket ship it was and it's unusual if you think about in the industry how often do brands go through like such a transformative period keep in mind it took 12, I always say about 12 years before the company got to that BMW Mercedes status. It took that long to refresh the company. But how many companies go through that kind of transformation? I can't really think of many, to be honest. I was super fortunate. Super fortunate. And that sounds also that you were able to have some impact. You were able to sort of realize the impact that you were participating in, in one of your foundational career moments, which is really great. So many people could possibly have the experience of going to a big brand and just being kind of a cog in the wheel or a drone and not really realizing. I I imagine you gained some creative confidence, agency, chops in in all of that. You spent about seven years there, right? Something like that? Yeah, I mean, in total, I was in Audi for about six years, but I was in the Volkswagen group for 16 Okay, because after Audi, then you sort of segued over to Volkswagen of America? Yes, yeah. And it's important to understand, like, originally when when I joined, Volkswagen Group was Volkswagen and Audi. And that was under the late Dr. Ferdinand Pieck was at at the helm of the whole ship at the time. You know, he had so much vision and so much leadership. He was really driving the group. And that's when it started, they started to buy other brands. So they bought Lamborghini, they bought Bugatti, they took over Skoda, they took over Seat, they took over Bentley. And now the VW Group become this very, very prestigious thing just going off in every direction. And so that elevated that group and just so being part of that, that gave me a lot of credibility and as you say, kind of confidence. And, and just awareness, you know, and, and so that was 16 years of kind of starting at the bottom and, and seeing that thing grow into this. Now it's a, obviously it's a world dominating force. That was just awesome to see. And again, because they were buying up these other smaller brands, these prestige brands in many cases, they were also all going through these transformations that Audi went through, you know. So they bought Bentley at a low point and fixed that. They bought Lamborghini at a a low point and fixed that. So we were witnessing all of that at the same time. And that was also remarkable, these rebirths. Yeah. And as you're witnessing all that, are you also discerning the patterns? There's some things that work, right? And they're repeating that over and over again, and it's working each time. 
because each one of those was an exercise in rebranding, right? It was about rebirthing the company, taking the kind of legacy things that are awesome, infusing new technologies and new development and, of course, new design and refreshing it all, you know. And so there was absolutely a kind of pattern that was forming there. It was just incredible to watch. You know, there was a lot there. Well, you say watch, but you were participating in it as well, right? I mean, the microbus concept is is exactly that, what you just described. I don't know which are your favorite projects. I'd actually like to know. It must have been cool to sort of revisit a, a microbus that you have such fond feelings for and, and give it a update. <laughs> yeah, that was the nice thing and really the appeal of moving over to focus on the Volkswagen brand because when I very first joined to work with Jay Mays in the concept studios, they were working on the new Beetle. So when I hired in, uh, the, the, the whole studio was focused on... That was a big on, moment. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, was, I got to be part of that in the early stages with Jay Mays and another gentleman by the name of Freeman Thomas. And so in the early 90s was this kind of wave of nostalgia in the car industry. And so there was a lot of retro design going on. Jay and Freeman were super focused on kind of the rebirth of that nostalgia within the Volkswagen group, which originally the German management was really resistant to because the history of Volkswagen in America was very different than how it was viewed in Germany and in Europe, you know, where Americans, the first thing when you said Volkswagen, they thought about the Beetle, even though the Beetle hadn't been sold for 15, 20 years at that point were bringing all that back in the Beetle and then later on having the chance to work on the, the early microbus concept was really, really cool because it, it was very much at, at the roots of where I came from. And of course, it wasn't just the microbus. We had ideas for a new thing and a Carmen Ghia and everything imaginable, you know. And so uh, it's just the microbus was, was a pretty high profile concept. This all sounds like really fruitful time for you. Your whole path so far feels a little charmed. I'm sure there were challenges, and I don't want to minimize how much you were growing and learning along the way. I don't want to skip over Mazda, which is where you went next. I guess I want to understand why did you make the jump from Volkswagen to Mazda, where you did some really amazing work, and then to the startup? After 16 years of VW Group, having gone through that really exciting, explosive kind of growth, seeing it get to a certain level and having been a part of that, I felt like it was kind of a career plateau in a way where I felt like I need to find that explosive growth again. I realized seeing change rapidly and then also being at a company when it's hungry for change is the best place for a designer to be. You're given freedom, you're listened to, you can affect change, and change is what motivates me uh, and, and others, I think, in, in my field. That's a really profound thing to recognize and f for me to tell my students. But yeah, being at a, a company that's hungry for change does open up doorways for designers more readily. It really does, and, and you hear it all the time, but timing truly is everything, and it's like... When I came into the VW Group, Audi and Volkswagen, when I made those changes, the timing was perfect. And I was feeling restless a bit later on in my Volkswagen career. I was seeing a complacency set in that was not in any way appealing. And I felt like boxed in, like we're not getting anything done here. I think it's it's time. And that can be soul sucking for a creative, right? That, that where you're kind of like, I can't break down this, these boundaries because people have boxed us in. And, and unfortunately, in big corporations, th these things are cyclical, right? They go through waves. Yes. And I've heard this from people in all industries. Yeah. It's super common, right? Big companies, they hit troubled times and they get scared and then they get o open to, and hungry for change. And then they change and they have success and then they grow and they bring people in that don't know how they got there in the first place. And then they get, get complacent and then it goes through the cycle again. And when you get boxed in, it makes everything that you want to do, all of your creative energy, it's such a heavier lift. It is, especially as a creative in the corporate world, because what ends up happening is you spend, you're spending much more of your time on selling 
and strategy over the creative content itself. So, you know, it's like I realized like I've become like a really good pitch man because <laughs> over the years, because I'm always <laughs> pitching ideas. And, and that's a great talent. And, and, and all designers should learn that, that those skills. But you start to realize like, shit, am I just a salesperson? I realized that uh, that's a fundamental thing in, to have any impact on any business uh, and to have any leadership capability within an organization. I just realized that, yep, that's part of being a good designer. The Mazda opportunity came along. Mazda was at a low point, super hungry. They had just separated off from the Ford group. They were no longer American owned. They were going back to their Japanese roots, which somehow had appeal to me. Uh, I knew Mazda's history well because I was enthusiastic about it in uh, in my teenage years. They were always a company known for fun to drive, sporty vehicles, lightweight, nimble, very, very youthful brand. They were hungry. They're like, yeah, they wanted to change and grow. And so I, I jumped into that exactly at the right time. It was also culturally interesting because I had gotten so used to a European point of view, I considered myself this kind of American Euro hybrid, spoke German and all of that stuff. And then to go work for the Japanese and really it couldn't be more culturally different, you know, it wow, was just drastically yeah. shift. And the approach to car design was drastically different. I mean, drastically different. That was like a really great learning experience. And also because that they were hungry, they were learning from me. I was learning from them. And that was just awesome. Those first few years were exciting and dynamic and really helped mature me. Adding that new cultural framework to the repertoire also sounds like a really fascinating learning adventure for you. And then also now that you, you come to where you are now with a broader cultural perspective, because you've been to those different places, you've, you've operated from those different perspectives. Totally. And, you know, the Volkswagen group, every car company has this, but there was like a Bible to doing good design, right? And you just believe like, well, that's, that's the truth. And that's the only way. And then you go to another company, it's like, oh, shit, they have their own Bible. Like, it's a totally <laughs> different Bible. And you're saying, yeah, but did you think about this? And, and then you realize, like, okay, there's benefits to both of these worlds. And, and now you have something, again, completely new. Um, and so it's just a really interesting experience for growth. So talk to me about the jump to a startup, an EV startup in, in 2015. Is this more getting itchy and restless and chasing the hunger and the, and the change? Yeah, I think it was because I was also fortunate, again, th through that period of my, uh, after I came back from Germany, working in California, I had been kind of focused on Volkswagen, especially through um, the early 2000s in California. And that's when the, the first rise of the hybrid in California, because like, you know, the Prius really kind of captured Southern California and, and just California in general as, as a, a bit of a um, new trend. And so there, there was already a lot of hybrid talk and, and, and then the beginnings of like electric car experimentation was 2005 around that time. So I was watching all that happen. I had a close friend of mine say, hey, he, in fact, I took his job at Mazda. He's like, I'm leaving Mazda. I'm going to, the, to uh, this company, Tesla, with Elon Musk. At that time, nobody had really heard of Elon. And even Tesla was just really, really under the radar. You know, it was a, a real uh, uh, science project. And I'm like, you're crazy, man. Nobody starts a car company. That's insane. You know, <laughs> that I'll take your job. I'll take your old job. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and so and then we had... All the Southern California design studios, which is, there was a lot of them, we had people leaving the studios to join Tesla. So I had a lot of friends joining up, and you'd hear all these crazy stories of what they were doing, and it was like, wow. And then to watch that manifest itself kind of from 2010 onward to 2015, while I was at Mazda, you know, busy on that, it was like, man, they did it. They pulled it off. This is incredible, you know. So then there was a lot more electrification discussion. Mazda wasn't really interested in that. They just didn't, when it wasn't on their radar. They weren't focused on uh, electric cars. They weren't fo focused on connected technologies, autonomy. And that was just exploding in California. And 
this is all before like Dieselgate and Germany and all of that stuff. Then this opportunity came up. I met Peter Rawlinson and said he, you know, he had left Tesla, kind of the engineer behind the Model S, and we want to start this new company. That's when I was like, okay, this is a kind of opportunity that doesn't come along. I should, I should probably give this a shot. Yeah, and talk about an opportunity to have real impact. So you joined Lucid Motors. It was then Ativa in 2015 uh, as the head of design and brand. You tell me, but I assume you have something to do with the whole ethos of the company in the, in the design being so integrated with engineering. They're not separated. They're not asking to apply the design on top of the engineering to make the engineering look good. It's a collaborative, in concert kind of effort. To me, that seems like it would make all the difference in just making a better outcome, solving problems in a more elegant way, working through things through the, both the design angle and the engineering angle in a collaborative and synergistic way so that you end up with a greater output than from being asked to just deal with something and make it look good <laughs> later. But I'm not a car designer, so I, I want to hear your take yeah. on that. When I joined, it was only like 50 people or 75 people maybe at the time. And there were groups within a, the building. You know, there was the engineering group, and the suspension team, and aerodynamicist. And, but the design team was only a handful of people. And so we, it was really like, okay, you know, roll up our sleeves, let's design a car. And then it was like, well, what are we designing? Is this, a, what's the company? What, what's our, you know, what are we going after here? So we had to kind of create parameters because you can't do everything. And it's like, you know, that was, that's where we started to talk more about the brand and the customer and how we want to position the company. What type of vehicle should it be? What kind of attributes should it have? We had a lot of debate and discussion in those early days in, in 2015, and then really got to work on, on a design and tr to try to visualize the design and lay it out. And, and that, because there was no departments per se, everybody was in one building just working together to get stuff done. And, and P Peter Rollinson also had a very strong ethos of design and engineering, just working hand in hand to solve problems, support each other on that effort and working collaboratively where it's less the case in the big car companies, partly because they're so big, they're working on multiple vehicle lines and there's platforms and it's much more prescriptive. And so this was an opportunity to really clean sheet uh, approach, everybody working tight together, and then also teaching the teams to have empathy for each other in terms of like the design is trying to achieve this, they want the car to be low, they want the car to be wide, and da da da. And then the engineering team needs the car to be aerodynamic or else we can't make it efficient. The car has to be spacious and comfortable, so the proportion might be a little unusual compared to cars today. Design has to try to make that work in understanding what you're trying to achieve and really taking, in many ways, a form and function being complementary to each other approach and trying to embrace that was really, really uh, exciting. And all the while trying to create something that was unique to us, that felt new and fresh, but at the same time wasn't so futuristic that it would scare existing luxury customers away. You know, we had, had to find that sweet spot of, of new versus traditional because, you know, at the time, all luxury cars were very traditional. That was kind of the starting point. Seems like something in there is working because the <laughs> Lucid Air was named Motor Trends 2022 Car of the Year. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. I would love to learn a bit about your creative process and what you think your real strengths are in terms of maybe it's a management style or get coalescing a team or maybe it's clay modeling. But can you talk me through the major highlights of your creative process? Yeah, sure. I mean, probably the Lucid Air is a good example of that. When I came in, there was really no understanding of where to start. There was not even descriptive adjectives of what we were trying to do, you know? This makes sense now. This is why you're head of brand as well as head of design. Yeah, because it's like those things are chicken and egg, in my opinion. At, at Mazda or at Audi, they already had all the descriptive terminology for what a Mazda needed to be or an Audi needed to be. And you, you, you can tweak that stuff and adjust it 
and, and have wordplay on it. But those things were in place, and you, most of the time you weren't challenging those things. Or if you were challenging, you were doing it in an evolutionary way. It's like, we're here, we're about this, and let's shift it here so we, we shift to the market and a new consumer or adjust the consumer or evolve the company. But that was really like shades of gray. And in here, we, we had nothing. So you really had to sit down and say, okay, what are we going after? That was a psychographic discussion about who are these people that would buy this really ad advanced electric car? Or do they really care about range? Do they care about performance? Are they gr kind of green focused? Or are they luxury want to brag about their success what is it you know so you're trying to dig down into consumer mindset and and i think we all had a strong understanding that the industry was in on the verge of big changes and it was going to also have be driven partly by consumers and early adapters and we'd already witnessed that for those first few years of tesla and we saw, saw where some of the, that's why I brought up the hybrid thing, because a lot of the uh, Prius owners went and bought Teslas, you know. And so those are the early adapters, and, and, and that was a Californian phenomenon. And so we were like, okay, what's next, you know. And so laying out that strategic framework, rather than just starting to sketch designs, what are you designing? What's your objective? I always feel like laying out your objectives first and giving the team a target to go after creatively and then evolve from there is super important. But what was also exciting at the time is, so we had no brand identity, we had no exterior design DNA, we had no interior design DNA, we had no user experience, user interface roadmap or parameters, we had no branded visual language for photography or fonts or, you know, so we got to build out each one of those columns with a common DNA and some individual goals in each column to try to link it all together at once. Again, you get some little opportunities like that in the big car companies, but it's very monolithic and it's very established. That was super exciting and that's where the brand component came into play. Yeah, I mean, how juicy for you to be able to be in a decision-making capacity through every element of the DNA of this brand. It, it, it was uh, super exciting, but it was out of necessity because yeah, the company yeah. <laughs> was so small. When I came in, I think they were like, okay, Derek's here, let's start designing the car. And, and I kept saying, wait a second, like, we got to get all this figured out, you know? That it was just out of necessity. It was like nobody said, hey, Derek, we need you to set up the DNA for all of these things. And it was like we kind of took it upon ourselves in the design group to just map all this out. And in many ways, that was the beginning of our uh, investor pitch because that, that's the pitch. Because when you're in a startup like that, more than half of your job is raising money. And so we had to come up with a story that we were telling investors that were coming through. And you already got the pitching skills from before. Exactly. Uh, exactly. So, this is great. <laughs> yeah. So we, we had to kind of put, string together a, a plausible story of who we are, what our mission is, what we're about to make, who the customer is, uh, where it's going to be positioned in the marketplace, where the customers are going to come from. You know, they're driving this today. They're going to drive this tomorrow. We had to really fine tune that pitch to get investment interest. And that, that was all part and parcel of this whole thing. And of course, Peter and others were involved in that pitch, but somehow, it, it, you know, your first product is a major part of that. And, and the market you're going after is all I made a big part of that. So it all became one cohesive story as we were developing the car. That makes a lot of sense. That's a very holistic ecosystem that the car is born from. I truly hope I get to drive one one day. There, <laughs> just really come on by. We'll get you in a car. Really I promise. Beautiful. So I want to ask you one more question before I let you go. It's related to cars, but it's also just kind of related to the future. I'm sure your your brain and your heart has been trained on the future of cars for a long time, and you've continually gone to where the action is, where the change is, where growth is happening. I want to know what you think about the future of roads and parking lots. So much of our world is paved. Can you envision a different future? It's undeniable that we have our mobility challenges, whether you talk about traffic or parking. 
There are many things happen in the world that affect the, that dynamic, but you know there is a, a tipping point where you just can't build roads fast enough. You know, so I think there are a lot of challenges around mobility and vehicle ownership that I think are being explored on on many different levels. But at the same time, I do think there is a desire for personal mobility, which is still very much alive and well, you know, globally, and certainly in this country, and trying to find that balance between personal ownership versus a shared experience versus autonomous robo-taxis and, and, and then things like mass transit, as well as people working from home. You know, all of these things have an effect on that dynamic. I personally think, you know, one of the most important things we can possibly do is accelerate this transition to electrification because I, is, I genuinely think that has a dramatic impact on the environment, on the air that we breathe, on, on greenhouse and, and global warming. And, and the automobile is a major contributor and has traditionally been so, uh, even if I just look at you know growing up in and around Southern California and how, seeing how the impact of uh, smog regulation and now the shift to EV has changed the, the air. It's, I remember not being able to breathe in the summers growing up and that never happens anymore. Uh, and so this stuff does make a, a difference. In the immediate, that's, that's a big priority. I think as we transition to autonomous technologies, this is going to help things a lot. It's going to help with safety. It's going to help with finding a parking spot. It's going to help with traffic congestion. Uh, and I think that that future is inevitable on some level. Yeah, I talked to a designer who's a, kind of reimagining urban planning, and his position was that the grid is, is a real problem. But if we we're thinking more along the lines of a cellular formation, then we wouldn't have so many intersections and we wouldn't have to walk along the roadways. We could, you know, separate our green space and our living space from our roadways. And I think what makes me really excited about the future is the electrification coupled with a kind of reimagined urban arrangement. I think the urban planning discussion is an interesting one, and there's many different philosophies there. But those are also very difficult to implement long term, especially in existing cities. Where, oh, you, you can't tear you down know, a whole city and rebuild it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's really tough. I tend to put more thought towards kind of where are we going with the electrical grid infrastructure and how electricity as a resource is implemented across all channels, whether it be home, office, commercial, how that balances with electric cars plugging into the grid. Are they charging off of solar? Um, are we balancing as we grow our renewable energy infrastructure? Uh, can electric cars pay a part of that energy storage or help balance the grid? You know, all of this needs to grow. If everybody all of a sudden drives electric cars tomorrow, we won't be able to charge them. Right. So so all, all of the infrastructure in, uh, of this is so important to grow this in unison and make sure that it's balanced. And, and so the adaptation can happen in a responsible and rational way. We're watching the revolution as we speak. I mean, the United States is about 24 percent renewable energy right now. That's pretty exciting. But that needs to grow substantially along with the charging infrastructure, you know, whether it be in public places or in, in homes, and how, how, how are we addressing that? These things are super important because energy independence and, and supporting the mobility side of it is just so important to growth. And, and, and if I look at what other countries are doing, how Europe's handling this and evolving, how China is way ahead on, on these topics and, and how to handle it, um, it it's a super important uh, focus. Agreed. This has been really fascinating. Thank you so much for for giving me the the inside intel on your whole career and your life story, but also on the dynamics that need to be in place in order for the great moments that you had at each of these corporations had to do with them being hungry for change. And I think that's that's a really important piece of this that I'm going to be thinking about for a while. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate it. And look forward to talking to you again. Hey, thanks so much for listening. For a transcript of this episode and more about Derek, including images of his work and a bonus Q&A, head to cleverpodcast.com. If you can think of three people who would be inspired by Clever, please tell them. It really helps us out when you share Clever with your friends. 
You can listen to Clever on any of the podcast apps. Please do hit the follow or subscribe button in your app of choice so our new episodes will turn up in your feed. We love to hear from you on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Please stay tuned for upcoming announcements and bonus content. You can subscribe to our newsletter at cleverpodcast.com so you don't miss a thing. Clever is hosted and produced by me, Amy Devers, with editing by Rich Straffolino, production assistance from Alana Nevins and Anushka Stefan, and music by L1011. Clever is a proud member of the Surround Podcast Network. Visit surroundpodcasts.com to discover more of the architecture and design industry's premier shows.